This malware right here is almost completely undetected by AV vendors up until about a few minutes ago when it was scanned. One malicious signature assigned by AV vendors. This is actually a bit interesting the way that the malware works because it is bundled within an Electron application in order to remain undetected on an endpoint. So the majority of the code that is actually there is benign Electron application code, making it more difficult for AV vendors to signature. Let's take a bit more of a look at what this malware is and how it functions. And just on a side note, if you are interested in Electron-based malware samples and this sample here definitely go and check out subatomic on hack the box as this is a new sherlock that's being released with some challenges associated with an electron based malware sample first off it was uploaded by someone on malware bazaar and it is said to have a command and control of illitmagnetic.site now illitmagnetic is some sort of k-pop song or music and it was downloaded from this other website called serenit therapy.xyz. Now a scan of that seems to be maybe a game. So it's possible that this is targeting gamers and maybe is being distributed through something like Discord, another service commonly used by gamers. But let's dive a bit more deep. In the details of this malware, something is a bit interesting. Number one, it's digitally signed, but it doesn't verify. So the chain is broken and it's not a valid signature. This actually has something specified as a SPC, SP Opus info within the digital signature. You can provide supplementary information about the signed software within the signature that then can be displayed. Now, this actually has the name Windows Update Assistant and specifies Microsoft where you can go and get more information. So this is doing something a bit strange where it's not only posing as this Serenity therapy game or whatever software this is, but it's also posing as Windows Update. ¿Por qué no las dos? and then specifying Microsoft where you can go to get more information. Now, obviously this is not the case and this is not accurate, valid signature that you would expect to see on something like this. If we look at the creation timestamp that's specified here, it was apparently created back in 2018, which just doesn't seem right. So maybe it's been time stomped as well. The signature date is also 2022. So maybe this is a signature that has been stolen from a legitimate Microsoft piece of software or update and has been embedded on this installer. But let's dive a bit deeper. So first off, this is NSIS. So using Detected Easy, we can determine that this is the Nullsoft Scriptable Install System installer, which means that we have the ability to use something like 7-zip to extract the files contained within this installer. Now, if we look into that, there is a plugins directory, an uninstaller directory, and an NSI that specifies how the installer is going to function. So we could review this NSI file and take a look at what it's going to be doing when it installs the executable. So of interest is show install details, never show. So nothing is really going to be shown in that regard. If we go down further, we can also see reference to the particular mutexes, anything that's going to happen, where it's going to be installed. But there is also mention of the installer directory. So when we're talking about Nullsoft installers being used, something that is of interest is that they can contain both the uninstaller, so in this case we have it here, and the installer itself. So you have to be careful that the uninstaller that you have is not also going to be running malware. So it could install as software or adware or a pop, whatever you are classifying it as, malware, and then if you use the uninstaller, maybe it will kick off even more malware. Now let's dive a bit deeper into how this is functioning. You will notice the shortcuts being created such as the serenity therapy installer.exe. So this is really where I want to target the next part of my analysis. So if we go back and we look in the plugins directory, there is this app 32.7zip file. Now this is going to be a core part of what we need to investigate. I'm going to unzip this using 7zip and this is going to give us the components required for this installation to occur. 
So looking within it, you can see now the Serenity Therapy Installer.exe, and this is quite large. This is 135 megabytes, which is not surprising for an Electron application that has to bundle essentially a lot of the capabilities that you would find in a web browser. We can actually tell that this is an Electron application, number one, by this icon. This icon is indicative of an Electron application. We can also see license.electron.txt, which if we open up in Notepad, we'll talk about Electron contributors and essentially have the copyright information. We can be pretty sure that this is actually some sort of Electron application. Now, if we look at the resources as well and dive in there, you will notice that there is this app.asar file and elevate.exe. Now, where we want to focus our efforts is the app.asar file, because we can actually essentially decompile the scripts that's going to be running whenever this malware functions. So we have to remember that this is going to work similar to a web browser and it's going to be interpreting scripts. So malicious scripts is where we should focus a lot of our efforts in reversing. There's a couple of ways that we can get the contents of this ASAR package. We could use a 7-zip extension, but we could actually use the node package manager in order to install the ASAR module and then use that in order to extract this ASAR package. So let's just open up a command prompt. And what we're going to do is we're going to use npx and we're going to be looking at an electron package and it's going to be the ASAR and we are just going to use the extract. So this is going to allow us to extract it. We are going to choose app.asar which is the name of the file here. And I will give it a new folder and we'll just call this extracted. So now if I was to use this and run it to the directory extracted, so NPX will go off, it will get the necessary package required and it will use that in order to run extract against the ASAR package here. And that's gonna give us the extracted output. So in this case, I received an error saying that it cannot find the app or directory in my application roaming directory for NPM, but that's quite fine. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open that up and I'm just gonna create a folder and call it NPM. Now I'm going to run it again and it'll say it needs the following packages, no worries, okay to proceed. And this is going to pull what I need and then use it. That was the only error that I had there. It was that I needed to have a folder called NPM in my roaming directory. So I've created that. And now if I look in the extracted components, we actually have the package JSON file and we have the app JavaScript file and the modules associated with it. So if we look at the package JSON file first, there is still kind of the same messaging of this is Serenity Therapy Installer. It's going to have a list of dependencies that are going to be required. So we need the Primnode Depapi package the node add-on, the SQLite 3 and system information. And all of these need to be a particular version or up from a particular version. So upward is specified here. And they should be bundled within the package and be here available to us. We're gonna try to run this app.js script, but we're gonna try to debug it. And we're gonna use VS Code for this. So opening up VS Code, we can open up a folder, which is what we're gonna to wanna to do here. We're gonna find the malware directory that we had. And we're gonna get the extracted location and we're gonna select this folder. So now once we open up this folder, this is running in a virtual machine. So it's okay for me to say, yes, I trust the authors, but in no way would I trust the authors of this package. Anyway, we can see the modules, we can see this app package. And if we go on down to the run and debug, what we wanna do is create a launch JSON file because we are going to debug this node application using VS Code. So if we specify that, it's going to know that it has to launch the app.js file within this directory, which is fine. That's what we need. So if we hit launch, program, we can actually see if there's any issues. And in this case, there are some issues. So we're going to have to resolve them. 
The issue here specified is that depappy.node is not a valid Win32 application. So obviously the version that is bundled with this is not functioning on my particular operating system after I've extracted it in this method. But that's okay because we can just install it and make sure that it works. So to ensure that this runs properly, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into the node modules. I'm going to find the problem one. So we do have depappy here. So I'm just gonna nuke this entire folder. And now that the folder's gone, I'm gonna to try to install that module again and see whether it functions. So I'm gonna open up my command prompt and I'm gonna run an npm. I'm gonna run install. We are gonna use the primno and we are gonna specify to Pappy. So this should go out and grab what is required. Yep, so it says it's up to date and it found zero vulnerabilities. Cool. Let's try and run our malware again. So in this instance, there was another error. However, this is for a different package. This is now specifying that SQLite 3. So the node SQLite 3 module is having some issues. So I'm gonna fix that one up as well. Let's go down and find that. So we have SQLite 3, and I'm just gonna delete that. Now I'm gonna run pretty much the same method uh, I did before, except instead of installing primnode to Pappy, we are just gonna have SQLite 3. Yep, so it looks like we got what we needed. It's got 123 packages that got installed with it. And we have likely everything that we need to run this malware. So let's try again. So I've gone back to VS Code now, and I'm just gonna give it a shot and see what happens. First off, I want to run it, but I also want to be able to analyze it. So on the left-hand side, we have variables and the call stack. And these are kind of things that I wanna keep an eye on as this runs. So if I launch the malware, we can see the program has launched successfully. I'm gonna see if I can pause it, but we may not be able to. And we can pause it. And straight away, you're starting to see something that's a little bit interesting. So there is mention of a payload. There is mention of GPU, et cetera, et cetera. But this could all be benign stuff, right? This says it's a system information library. So this might be completely benign. Let's see what else we have. We've got, we've got some stuff on the call stack here. There is something known as new injection. So suddenly this is a bit more interesting to me. So there is this new injection on the call stack There is going out and getting IP address information from ipinfo.io. There is this Discord injection as well. Let's see if we can follow that and we can. And so this looks like it's grabbing Discord tokens. So there is this or infecting Discord instances. This is very interesting. So there is browser cookies as well. So this actually might be the full functionality of this malware. So we might actually have it now. We can see the function is defined as anonymous and this is specifying a vowel and then a particular entry. So this looks like this has been dynamically built and thrown onto the call stack. If we go back to the malware and we look in app 32 and we look in the resources, we know this is running the app.js file. Now, if we open this up in Notepad++, we can see that this is a heavily obfuscated piece of JavaScript. Analyzing this and every single thing that's being returned by it can be quite challenging. However, because we've been able to break on this, we can actually see some of the stuff that has, is being dynamically built and then used by the malware we can probably look through these functions to get a bit of more of an idea and high confidence that this is actually malware that isn't being detected by a lot of AV vendors. For example, if we look down, there is mention of steel Firefox tokens, awesome token requests. So stuff to do with Discord, the new injection method that we saw. Immediately, we can begin to see also a number of tasks that are of interest. So this is looking to see if Opera is running, if FakeNet is running, if Wireshark or Fiddler is running. And if any of these particular processes are running after it 
executes a task list and sees them, it looks like it's just going to kill the executables. So that's going to hinder us in our analysis efforts. There's also this check VM. So this is going out and looking for particular virtual machines. There is the Elite Magnetic Site API, a user ID specified here, and Logout Discord. So this looks like configuration options for this piece of malware. So maybe there is some sort of specification as to whether someone is infected with this, whether it will kick them out of their Discord session or not. So this is actually really interesting. This is quite possibly everything that we need to know. So let's comb over and see what this malware is doing. So first off, the malware is taking a look at the total memory that has been assigned to the machine. And if it is less than 1024 by 1024 by 1024, so what are you looking at there? You're looking at kilobytes or bytes to kilobytes to megabytes. Basically, if you haven't got more than uh, two gigs of RAM by the looks of things, then it's just going to exit and it's not going to do anything. Then we're looking at the system name. So it is getting the host name of the operating system and it's comparing it to a lot of these hard coded strings. And if none of them match, then it continues. Otherwise, it exits. So there's obviously some checking to see if this is running in a VM, which ironically is the name of the function. Now there is the task list to task kill that we spoke about before. So this is also looking for stuff like VirtualBox and VMware tools. So if any of these things or Joe's Sandbox by the looks of things, JoeBox server, if any of these things are seen, it's once again, just going to, actually this time is going to kill those executables to hinder analysis. So it's not gonna exit itself. It's just gonna kill those executables so they don't get anything during their detonation. Then there's getting Discord tokens. So this is likely getting the particular token that is saved on your system and then using that in order to allow them to authenticate as you. So this is a bit interesting and it seems to, it is looking for encrypted tokens with a regex that's been specified here. And then it's going to extract or decrypt it. So because these are encrypted using DePapi, so they're encrypted using the data protection API on Windows, what it needs to do is use that in order to decrypt it before it sends it somewhere else. Because if it doesn't do that, then they're gonna have a token that they can't use because it's just encrypted junk. So that's a bit interesting. And it looks like it is taking these and then sending them away. So you're gonna get a token, you're gonna get a key, and then some other information associated with that as well. Then there's stealing Firefox tokens, then it's performing some sort of injection. So this looks like it's getting operating system information and then doing that Discord injection, which I'm sure we'll find out as we go along what that's doing. It makes a connection to ipinfo.io to get your publicly facing IP address that then is going to be sent off as well. It's going to then look at the options that you specify. So this options.api, this is the C2 that we're specifying here. So it's going to use that in order to figure out where it's sending the information. And then it's making a post request to that with the parameters new injection. So this is likely saying, hey, we've got a new infected system. Here's the information. And it's going to give the IP address, the country that's tied to that city, the network region, and so on and so forth, including the computer name, user, CPU, and all that other good stuff. Then we've got this token requests. So this is a bit interesting. So this is using the Discord API and it looks like it's going to use your ID to get your profile name. So it's going to use the Discord API, use your user ID that it's extracted through stealing the Discord tokens. And then it's going to find out what user that applies to, to figure out what access they have. What Discord access do they have? Then it's also going to use the API and look at payment sources. So maybe this is actually retrieving any kind of credit card details or other information that you have saved within your Discord. It looks like there is 
profile, payment sources, once again, financial information, it's being stolen here, checking your token, then stealing your Firefox token. So this is using the SQLite databases. So it's finding them on the operating system. And then from that, it's looking at hard-coded strings that are obviously known as particular tokens of interest. And then it's using that to say, hey, I found these Firefox tokens. There is also stealing of Discord here by the looks of things. So it's using the Discord desktop index.js file. And then it looks like it is getting that information as well. Hi everyone, it's Jai here from the future. So the reason why it's getting the index.js file is because that is located within one of the modules, in this case, the Discord desktop core module of Discord and that index.js file is going to be modified. So injected in this case, it actually makes a get request to the C2 server slash API slash injections. And the response of that is then going to be appended to this index.js file so that it is going to run malicious code when Discord starts up. And this is likely a way to intercept the requests on Discord as it is running as well, maybe even multi-factor authentication tokens or any other information of interest. So that's what this Discord injection method is doing. It is very much about infecting the Discord client itself. And determining whether it's gonna kick you out or not. So there is browser cookies. So it looks like it is getting stuff from a list of hard-coded browsers, but it is killing these browsers as well if they are found. So that's Chrome, Microsoft Edge, Brave, Opera, et cetera, et cetera. Then it looks like it is getting the cookies. So select star from cookies for your current user. Once again, using Depappy where required to make sure that it is decrypted. Got Firefox mentioned here, looking for Firefox cookies. Go down further, Firefox cookies. You know similar stuff browser passwords so stealing your browser passwords makes a lot of sense to me is there anything that you've saved in your browser your browser autofills that's a little bit more interesting not something that you see as much but basically if you've got anything to automatically fill it looks like it's going to be stealing that information as well so the name and data that's going to be filled within those the autofill when you go onto a website and you go to forms that you've used before. So that's quite interesting. That's quite useful for an attacker to be able to take that kind of information as well. Go down further. So get browser autofills. You got get browser passwords. Yep. Seen that. All browser data. So this looks like it's just essentially running and getting, you know, the browser cookies, autofills and passwords so that it's it's going to do it for all of them. It's going to send all of that information off. There is check CMD installation. So this would be as soon as that asynchronous process tries to run, it's going to be doing that VM check. It's going to then run check CMD installation, and then it's going to be running that new injection process as well. So all browser data, et cetera, et cetera. Let's see, exceptions. And this, remember that this is being done in this kind of like post request to the specified endpoint that has an API there. And so this is very much how that Electron application is functioning with this JavaScript that runs. So it does look like it's got that kill process stuff. So this is interesting. So it's checking to see if CMD doesn't exist at C Windows System 32. I'm not entirely sure what that is doing. Hey, it's Jai here from the future again. So basically this check CMD installation function is checking to see if cmd.exe does not exist within the system32 Windows directory. And if it does not exist, it's going to make a get request off to the C2 server using the slash API slash cmd hyphen file request and what this is going to do is then push down a executable presumably cmd.exe and it's going to be placing this in the users documents directory and then it's going to be setting the environment variable so that that is the specified com spec so the environment variable used in the same way that cmd would be 
So basically, it's just checking if you've got cmd.exe. And if you don't have cmd.exe, it looks like it's pushing its own version to the user's documents directory so it can function properly. But honestly, we can see the vast majority of exactly what this malware is doing, right? It is continuously trying to beacon to that and it is a information stealer. Now, I don't know if this has a name. I haven't seen any kind of Yara hits, but I think it definitely needs a name. So I've stopped the malware, but I was looking at this code and I noticed something a little bit interesting. In the headers under the get discord tokens async function, there is this parameter that's specified called duvet underscore user. So I was sitting here trying to figure out what this malware was and thought, well, I'm gonna name this duvet stealer because of this duvet user reference. Now, while looking for that string, one of the things that I like to do is look for that string across GitHub, just to see if there's any kind of open source malware that this might be related to. Now, I didn't quite find what I was after, but I did find something else of interest. There is this user Stux VT, and they mentioned this Sonic Glide Discord malware. So this is actually what I found when searching for that string. And so they claim that this is an Epsilon Stealer variant. So this could be a variant of Epsilon Stealer. Now, it looks like Sonic Glide here was the other game that was being used in this campaign that people were essentially pretending was a game for them to run. So it says that it is being distributed via a manual phishing in Discord DMs using the stolen accounts to pivot to new victims. And they're linking to this URL that then is going to be used to download the malware. So I guess in this particular case, they would then be instead linking to Serenity Therapy as the game that is going to be legitimately downloaded. So it seems like this is targeting individuals and they can come up with whatever games they like, right? They can pretend that it is some other game, but just by pivoting off of that indicator, this seems like it's going to be the same kind of malware. It's pretty interesting because this has the same characteristics that we saw in the malware we reversed. So the virus is an electron project and it is deobfuscating some JavaScript in order to then run in memory and, and be used to steal the Discord tokens. And if we look at the time of this project, it was only a couple of weeks ago that it was actually updated as well. So this looks like the individual here is investigating the same type of malware we are, but for a different game that's been specified. And so what I've done is actually gone out and downloaded a copy of the malware that this person is providing. And it's a bit interesting because if we go into it, you know, it was only from a couple of weeks ago, like we expected. And we look at the grabber.js file that they've provided. This is identical besides maybe the configuration details in the options here to the malware that we saw when we were doing our analysis. So if we go up, we can see this function and we can probably put these side by side. So if we go up, there are the options specified. This doesn't seem to have the check VM, which we saw here. If we go down a bit further, there are the same merge and get discord tokens. So get discord tokens is the first one up here with this duvet underscore user. So it looks really similar, right? Except, you know, without the anti VM check. Maybe this means that it is the same malware, except it can be configured to have different components in it. So there is this new injection once again, and we can see it does pretty much identical actions to what we found in our malware here. Remember, these are two different pieces of malware that we are analyzing. So if we go back, we can begin to see a few other things. The obfuscated JavaScript, even when it's deobfuscated, is a lot of gibberish, as we can see here. And we had that same issue when we are analyzing it. So stage two, there is this injection. And so this is doing something that we haven't seen. This looks like it is specifying some endpoints. Maybe there's some shell code or some just char byte characters that are being used here. But once again, this does look like it's stealing Discord information. So all interesting things. And if we look at the payload, we saw a similar thing with the NSIS setup file, the plugins directory. It looks like uh, it had similar aspect there as 
as well. So we have the same type of Electron application, which is being used to run malware on endpoints and steal Discord tokens, as well as browser tokens and passwords as well. Interesting enough, if we look at the pass.json, I'm not entirely sure where this has been extracted from, but this is a bit more interesting because it seems to have configuration details for where it's going to be stolen from. So there are browser processes. This seems to be the directory where stuff like the browsers are located on endpoints, and that's going to be where it's storing your username, password, credentials, tokens, anything else. So all interesting things under that past JSON file as well. But look, that's all I wanted to show you. We've got a good idea of what this malware is doing, even just through the analysis that we performed and then comparing it to some of the publicly available analysis of some other like-minded samples. So that's it. Thanks so much for watching. Uh, shout out to Stux, hacker VTuber, for putting their analysis out on GitHub, which made it much easier to track back other examples of this malware being used in the wild and how it's being targeted. And the only reason that they know is because they mentioned that a few of their friends got hit with this malware, so they decided to reverse it. So that's it. Any questions, comments, feelings, anything else in the comment section below? I might still call this duvet stealer because I can. <laughs> if you want to see more videos like this, let me know and I'll catch you next time.